Welcome once more to irishtv.us. I'm Mike Morley, and here we are in our studio just west of Chicago. Starting this week, I plan to add more interviews and other features to the show. And today we'll be speaking with an old friend, Chris Swider, recently retired as professor of film and script writing at Chicago's Columbia College. Chris has received many honors for documentary films and script writing. Chris, welcome to irishtv.us. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, you've made many films based on your own experiences and those of your father in Eastern Europe, and you spent a lot of time there yourself, I believe. Yes. Uh, you, you recently recommended that I see the new First World War documentary by Peter Jackson titled, They Shall Not Grow Old. I thought it was a real eye-opener. Jackson eliminated all the jittery black and white fog that had covered those old war newsreels for a hundred years and it brought them into brilliant, colorful life and in uh, 3D, no less. So right from the start, I felt uneasy for sitting nice and comfortable in a plush theater seat, snacking on popcorn as I watched these men suffering and dying under the most horrific circumstances. So how did the film strike you? Well, I got, liked it a lot. I, I think that um, it's uh, for a documentary filmmaker, it's a, it was a humbling experience because this was a uh, big box production that I could only dream about. The amount of money spent on technically improving the footage that he had to work with, the uh, I mean, the, the end titles with all of the technical staff went on longer than some documentary films. I mean, it, it's, it was awe-inspiring. But it, what it did is what a documentary film should do, is provide a window into a world, into an experience that you have not had. And that was very much the case there. The Western Front in the First World War is shown in I don't know if it's detailed, but I mean, it's it's real. It's This is not some kind of a Hollywood fabrication. And it was quite moving because of that. Uh, I would hasten to add that the Eastern Front in the First World War, very, very little is known about it in the United States or very uh, rarely is it talked about. And my understanding is that it was uh, a formidable bloodbath even worse than uh, the the film uh, and, and on the Western Front that we saw? That's my understanding, that uh, some of those big battles in East Prussia uh, that uh, the Russian generals would just decimate their own uh, divisions. But by decimate, you mean actually taking every 10th man and, and shooting him to... No, I, I didn't. Around. I didn't mean decimation in the Roman sense. No, uh, <laughs> just that the the casualties were so horrifically large, right? Um, and uh, compounded by, uh, you know, poor medicine, poor hygiene. Uh, uh, it, it was a, a, a tough, tough world. I would think. Um, now, my 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 mother's brother John fought in that war. And uh, I was surprised to learn many things about it, including that most ordinary officers uh, or, uh, or soldiers, as opposed to officers, received such a cold reception coming home after the war. They were the forgotten men, at least in Britain, looking for jobs, and they were told uh, no veterans need apply. Yeah, I, that, that was something of a surprise to me. I know... Uh, that that was to some degree the case in the United States, that veterans had been promised much and received little. Um, so there were later those uh, tent cities in Washington of veterans hoping to get the benefits that they had been promised. This was uh, a compounding problem to the Great Depression uh, of the 1930s. We'll be back in a minute with more.
Now you can watch Irish Journal Television online. Simply browse to our website, irishtv.us, and watch shows like this one anytime you choose. We have now made Irish entertainment available to you 24-7. Don't miss in-depth articles and other new features we're sure you'll enjoy. Watch us anytime. Remember, it's irishtv.us. Now, your, your own films have dealt not only with the horrors of war, but with the decades-long suppression of those horrors. Uh, tell us about your film, Children in Exile, if you would. Yeah, I uh, grew up with uh, stories of uh, uh, Siberian exile. My parents uh, both uh, lived through the Second World War, uh, 19, 1939, when the war uh, started, uh, my father was captured by the Soviets and my mother ended up in uh, Nazi-occupied Poland. So each of them uh, experienced a uh, different genocidal regime. So I had grown up with these stories and uh, I would tell people uh, about my parents' experiences and uh, and people quite often would say, why, why are you writing the things you're writing about? I mean, you should make a film about this. So I started interviewing people and I went to Poland and to Russia and shot both interviews and documentary footage and acquired uh, documentary footage in Russia. So that's what I did. And there were these universal uh, experiences that people talked about when I interviewed them. First of all, the night of arrest. It was always at night. Uh, the way that the, these people were treated, the panic of the family as they're uh, packing uh, what they're going to be allowed to take and what it makes sense to take, what it doesn't make sense. So uh, the prize item is, uh, you know, a tea kettle, for example. If you did that, you know, if you took a tea kettle, you're smart. And of course, Siberia, so warm clothing, and uh, some people already were prepared for uh, the eventuality of arrest, so they would sew uh, jewelry and valuables into their clothing so they could safeguard it during deportation. The trip in the boxcar, the, uh, how you dealt with bathroom functions in this constrained circumstance. This was not a passenger wagon most of the time, but just a freight car. And uh, the toilet facilities were a hole in the floor. And this uh, was a universal problem. Everybody talked about it, no, no matter who it was. And it was... Did you, uh, did you find anything more about your father's own experience from, uh, from your research? Yes. Uh, through uh, a series of phone calls, I made contact with the memorial organization in Russia, uh, which is, uh, you know, to the organization's purpose, its function is to remember uh, Stalinist oppression. And I contacted some people in the town of Ukhta in Komi, which is a part of the Russian Federation the western side of the Urals and the Komi Republic extends past the Arctic Circle. I had learned that the prison file followed the prisoner and it remained where the prisoner was released. So we're led into a side room. Uh, Mr. Potolitsin hands the request to this attractive young woman who is going to discover whether she can find it. And uh, five minutes later, she returns with this file and she says, here it is. 
And she says, but do not take any pictures of the file. That's forbidden. And then she walks out and she closes the door. So as soon as the door closes, Mr. Potolitsin, Vitali says, okay, start taking the pictures. So <laughs> I, I, I did. And uh, I opened the file and there is a photograph of my father a mugshot, a Soviet prison mugshot of him, younger in the picture than I am at the moment that I'm viewing it. And uh, my father was a tough guy. He was a self-made man. Uh, he came from a peasant family. He was very bright. He went to uh, medical school at the University of Warsaw on a military scholarship. He was a career army officer and ended up getting a PhD in medicine. And uh, was in the medical corps of the Polish army, uh, which is why he was arrested. In the picture, you can see this toughness. This was a guy who uh, he had survived uh, in very difficult circumstances, worked his way through high school, and then got this scholarship to medical school. And he was a, he was a tough guy. Um, and the whole file then it uh, follows, chronicles his saga in Soviet imprisonment. So he had been in the prison camps where the prisoners had all been murdered in the infamous Katyn massacres. Katyn. Yes, and he had been transferred out three days before the killings started and moved out and shipped north to Vologda and eventually to Kom. In the file, I also learned, I'd never known, that he uh, knew German. So he was a polyglot. He spoke uh, uh, English, Polish, Russian, Italian, German, uh, classical Greek, and Latin, uh, a educated man. We'll be back in a minute with more. You, you actually spoke uh, at one point with uh, Jaruzelski, is that correct? The, uh, yes, yes. Or... So, yeah, so he was the president and uh, first secretary of the Polish Communist Party. He was a general, uh, a collaborationist of the first order, uh, a communist, a believing communist. Uh, and so now he, he, he knew quite a bit about the subject that you were you were dealing with but uh, I, I believe you told me that when, when the when people viewed the film they, they they didn't so much as listen to the horrors that he was describing they just reacted to seeing him on the film is that correct or that's pretty much true he was to uh polish people of a certain political persuasion uh, he is uh a a villain, a stooge, a toady to the to the Soviet. Pamiętam dzień 14 czerwca 1941 roku. Wczesne godziny ranne, chyba musiała być jakaś godzina piąta, szósta, łomatanie do drzwi i wreszcie wchodzą żołnierze, odczytują postanowienie o deportacji. Nie znałem wtedy rosyjskiego, więc tylko piąte, sześćdziesiąte mogłem się zorientować, że chodzi właśnie o to, że jestem uznany za element niepożądany i że podlegam zesłaniu. He is a very complicated character. He came from a family of uh, Polish insurrectionists who took part in the 19th century insurrections against Russian rule and somehow 
out of that tradition of rebellion, he managed to turn and become this collaborator. And uh, he uh, had great admiration for the Russians. Uh, I would mention that everybody I interviewed did not have anything bad to say about Russians. They would all very quickly say, the Russians did this to me, but the only reason I survived is there was a Russian that helped me, uh, which I, I was very struck by. Um, and the, uh, the other thing I was struck by is uh, how uh, nine out of 10, it's not completely true, but nine out of 10 uh, had this, uh, uh, you'd have to call it a magnificent human impulse to be able to find the threads of humor, the, what was funny in this miserable experience. And they did. I mean, and they would tell these stories, some of them, I mean, they're really kind of funny, you know. Um, For instance. But, you know, bear, bear in mind, I've talked to people that were in, you know, Nazi, Nazi concentration camps, and they would tell jokes about it. So, uh, and I've repeated those stories, and people would be appalled that I could repeat a story like that, and I would always say, now listen, uh, this is not me saying it. I'm repeating what somebody experienced. They have a right to joke about any darn thing they want to joke about. So the, this is the whistling while walking past the graveyard sort of reaction. Yes, yes, very, very much, very much. And it's, uh, again, to me, there's something uh, uh, triumphant about it. I mean, if, uh, you know, uh, you know, you hear all this malarkey about stressing the positive and stuff like that. And when you see somebody do it, sometimes, of course, it, it, it can be shocking. Slightly. How could my, my audience or our audience get to see some of your work? Uh, the documentary film is uh, available on Vimeo and uh, it's called Children in Exile. And I guess if you look it up on v Vimeo, you can find it. this might be uh, of interest to you, the uh, similarities between the uh, Irish political problem and the Polish political problem are quite striking. And the uh, similarities in well, our culture. Well, well of, course, of course, being uh, being blessed or cursed by living right next to a very powerful neighbor is something that is shared and uh, not only a neighbor, but an empire. <laughs> and uh, yes, and a hostile, a hostile empire. Yeah. Uh, and in uh, uh, both cases, so there can be the argument that this large empire, that these people are upstarts and savages. Americans are uh, not particularly aware of uh, the Polish predicament, but I mean, the Russians invaded Poland three times in the 20th century. Uh, and dominated the country for, of course, the whole communist period, which uh, you know, I lived there for two in that time. And uh, uh, it was uh, difficult to explain to Americans who are uh, uh, unappreciative of, of the charm of the life that they have, how, how lucky uh, we are to be able to live uh, as Americans. And I would tell people that... Uh, you know, you couldn't get anything, you couldn't make a Zix copy without the permission of a police censor. If you wanted to get a copy, you had to go to the neighborhood police station and get permission. I, I knew these wow. guys who were studying, you know, photography and uh, uh, they were cinema, cinematography students. And, you know, so they were interested in art history and the history of photography and to make copies from the books, they would literally take a photograph with a camera, develop the film, and then print the photograph. That was less trouble getting the, you know, series of uh, permits necessary to get something uh, copied. Uh, the bigger absurdities were, were much worse. I mean, uh, 
a limited. So how, how, is, how, how is the internet now affecting that process? Well, the internet, of course, exploded all of that. As soon as the communist system ended, you know, what were the first things that opened up uh, post-communist Poland? So there were copy shops. Everybody, I, I mean, modern life, we take for granted that uh, we make copies. Uh, and interestingly enough, also the other thing that uh, I noticed when, when I went, went back there, and I said I would not go back until... Uh, the communist system was finished, and that's what I did. Uh, and the other thing that, that uh, exploded w was uh, porn shops. So, again, people are interested in pornography. People like it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, the uh, other uh, if effects uh, were that uh, people certainly started drinking much less. Uh, you couldn't get away with work uh, drunk uh, and uh, interestingly also that people started to jaywalk a little bit of defiance i suppose yeah, in, yeah. The, in the face of the oppressor yeah and the the other you know very pleasant effect my my parents were of you know, the post-world war ii generation were people who had excellent manners they very gracious uh, you know uh, a gentleman was a gentleman, a lady was a lady. I mean, it was uh, very, very nice. The communist system is rough on manners, to put it mildly. And uh, this uh, persists to some degree, but uh, the uh, impulse that uh, Polish people have to being well-mannered has returned, and uh, that's pleasant. Uh, well, I, I, I think the uh, <coughs> a pleasant discourse... <coughs> Is uh, is being erased from this country uh, uh, bit by bit as well. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, you. Uh, it it's it starts with the fact that people don't feel any <clears throat> interest in talking to people they disagree with. And uh, what I don't want to talk, who I don't want to talk to, is people who think like me. I like talking to people who are different than me, but I, I know from contact with my students, uh, uh, my students were often just absolutely shocked when I told them that I had had conversations with uh, uh, American Nazis and white supremacists and American communists, and they were like, how can you talk, talk to them? And I was like, how can you not? Don't you want to understand what people are like? why somebody is uh, uh what kind of a person buys into uh a uh a, a white supremacist scheme um and uh you know again you have to appreciate in the nazi white supremacist scheme uh roman catholics uh slavs like polish people subhumans you know we, we were uh, simply waiting in line after they got done with the Jews, they were going to finish finish us off. Well, very interesting. I, th I think we, we, we're, we're going to have to talk some more down the line. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor of Film and Script Writing, Chris Schweider. Thank you, Mike. Talking You're to welcome. you again. Bye-bye now. We'll be back in a minute with more. The drums are silent, the guns are now still, the men from the war come back over the hill. Don't start counting heroes, too many gaps to be filled. The one truth about war is it kills. The cow has strayed into the heather mud.
mother Will there be no milk for the tale? All the time I was away Wondered if anyone missed me I thought of my lovely Mary Who works upon the fire And I wondered if she'd smile on me As I offered her my arm And bow down politely Take a waist lightly Skip round the floor in the one, two, three, four With my heart held up highly And I shine brightly and Dance with my love in the Tipperary walls I killed a man in Flanders I killed a man in Spain But the man that I killed in Ireland They all still haunt my dreams So says every soldier Who was killed with lead or with steel From the sons of Alexander To the ghosts of our own Dan Breen Bow down politely Take a waist lightly, skip round the floor in the one, two, three, four. With my heart held up highly, and I shine brightly, dance with love in the temporary wall. find the place we called hell where I pray that the light of heaven would not our death reveal then someone whistled a recruiting tune and it filled me full of rage and I found these words in a soldier's hand with blood upon the page Bow down politely Take a waist lightly Skip round the floor In the one, two, three, four With heart held up highly And I shining brightly Dance with love In the temporary walls Bow down politely Take a waist lightly, skip round the floor in the one, two, three, four. With heart held up highly, and I shine brightly. Dance with love in the temporary.